Good evening and welcome to this evening's presentation by Dr. Minio Blanco, Mexico's candidate for Director General of the World Trade Organization. I want to give a very special warm welcome to our other guests, Ambassador Luis Alfonso de Alba, Permanent Representative of Mexico to the United Nations, Ambassador Guillermo Dzinski, and Permanent Representative of Canada to the United Nations, Elsa Gladys Silfuentes, Consul General of Colombia, Jorge Lopez, Consul General of Ecuador, Ambassador Oscar Padilla Lam, Consul General of Guatemala, Ambassador Jose Luis Perez Gabilondo, Consul General of Argentina, and of course, my dear friend and our dear friend, the Consul General of Mexico here in New York, Carlos Saba. Thank you very much and welcome again. And I would like to thank MetLife, who was our 2013 Mexico series sponsor. And finally, this room is very full, but I would also like to welcome everyone that is joining us from around the world via webcast. And I want to thank our global webcast sponsor, Telefonica. We are honored this evening to have Dr. Blanco with us. As you are all aware, as an, and as I mentioned, Dr. Blanco is Mexico's candidate for the post of WTO Director General, and he is here tonight to speak to us about his candidacy. Dr. Blanco's qualifications speak for themselves. He has played a critical role in the design and implementation of the structural changes that have made Mexico's economy more competitive and more open. He has served as Trade and Industry Minister of Mexico at a very crucial time from 1994 to 2000. He was also Vice Minister of International Trade at a very important moment and Vice Minister of International Trade Negotiations. And he was Chief Negotiator for NAFTA as well as for the agreement with the European Union, as well as many other bilateral agreements. He also has great experience in the private sector, advising federal and local governments, corporations, and international organizations on trade policy. Additionally, he is founder and current CEO of IQOM, I'm not quite sure what it stands for, Inteligencia Comercial, a company focused on international trade-related analysis, information, and strategic advice ser ser services. Fact is that Mexico is a fitting country to lead the World Trade Organization. Just look at its record. It is one of the most open, trade-friendly economies in the world with 17 free trade agreements in force, and as I understand it, probably more coming. Mexico's historical and ongoing commitment to trade and investment, and Dr. Blanco's relationship to where the country is today, are testimony to his outstanding credentials for the position of Director General. Again, I would like to thank everyone here tonight, and I would to thank everyone who is joining us by webcast, and I would now like to turn the program over to Dr. Blanco. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you to everybody. Uh, our apologies for the traffic in, in New York. That's uh, one of the reasons we are, we are late, but obviously the responsibility is, is ours. Um, I uh, uh, feel very good to be back in this house after many, many years. And if I may, uh, I will speak uh, briefly and uh, I will open up for your uh, comments and questions on the issues relating to the WTO. As Susan very well said, uh, I am in the process of this uh, selection for the World Trade Organization Director General. A very important institution, and I will speak some about that. Uh, an institution that works very well uh, in many instances, and, but an institution that nowadays is being challenged in different ways. 
I will tell you a little bit about myself. More probably I shouldn't say anything more of what Susan said. That she put me right up there. So, uh, but I, I will say something about why I think my experience and the skills developed through my professional life will help me be uh, a, a director general that will take uh, the status quo uh, forward in the WTO. So beginning to uh, speak about the WTO, uh, things that you, many of you, or most of you, or all of you already know, the, the World Trade Organization is the organization that regulates trade amongst 159 countries in the world. As you may imagine, most of those countries are countries uh, that are developing countries. It is fundamental uh, because it has established rules which are uh, stable and predictable in the world, rules that are multilateral, rules that allow especially small countries to have uh, a, a say in on very important uh, issues of trade. Uh, importantly, the WTO allows small countries to defend their interest and to push forward uh, on, on uh, other countries and to protect uh, the position of, of the smaller countries. It is uh, fundamental for world. I will say that uh, there is no doubt in my mind that as a, as a design and operation, the WTO operates very well in two of the three fronts in which WTO is supposed to operate and what are the mandates of, of the WTO. The first one uh, where uh, the WTO operates fairly well is in monitoring the fulfillment of the agreements that have been reached in the almost 70 years of GATT history and uh, WTO history. There, the exercise on transparency on the trade policies of the members is an exceptionally open and professional work that is done every day. The operations of the organs and the different uh, um, committees of the World Trade Organization is very good. Number two, the organization was also designed to solve the disputes amongst members on a technical fashion, not on a political fashion. And I will say that on the close to 400 cases that come up, have come up uh, to the dispute settlement mechanism, the results have been solving the uh, disputes among members on a very effective way, either at the end of the decisions of what is no, no, now known as the appellate body, the, the last uh, appellate uh, process that uh, a country can take, or through the process of um, arbitrage and at the end some type of negotiated solution amongst the countries. That front has worked very well, although uh, one can speak about uh, probably lengthy processes, probably uh, costly processes which uh, impact, and I, I could speak about this later on, that impact more on smaller countries than in large countries. Processes, uh, the legal costs of uh, taking a case into the dispute settlement procedure in WTO is indeed expensive. Uh, there are things that can be done to improve this. Uh, as a part of the whole negotiating package known as the Doha Agenda, there are issues that have been discussed and are being discussed on how to improve the workings of the dispute settlement. No doubt that on the third front, the WTO is not doing as well. The third front is that the WTO is supposed to be constantly moving forward in designing better rules to, uh, for trade, uh, in, in uh, promoting deep integration, deeper liberalization of trade, uh, of uh, merchandise and trade in, in services. So in this front, 
there have been 12 years of uh, pending negotiations that have not been concluded. Uh, negotiations which are fundamental for the world, but most importantly, these negotiations were called the Doha Development Agenda because there were a lot of uh, expectations from uh, developing countries and very importantly, least developed countries that through these negotiations, they will get uh, effective access to some of their products. Uh, some of these economies that have lowest levels of development, as you may imagine, concentrate their productive capacity in very few products. And those products, uh, as you also may imagine, are mostly agricultural products. So the um, barriers to exports of those products, both as uh, tariffs, as other impediments, and in a very important fashion, uh, subsidies on uh, the production and the exports of agricultural products have been a big drawback for the uh, growth and development of the exports of the least developed countries. So it is fundamental for those countries uh, that the Doha development agenda comes to a successful conclusion. But uh, you may say, well, if, if in 12 years it has not been solved, what makes you think that uh, there is a solution that can be delivered in the future to come. Uh, I, you, you maybe think that I'm too optimistic, but I do believe that we are in front of a, an opportunity window this year and in, in the uh, months to come. This year, we, we have uh, several elements that are a great coincidence. Uh, first, the fact that uh, at least the most negative what they call the tail scenarios of uh, the world economy are uh, slowly but surely uh, uh, fading out with some nice uh, sectors here in the U.S. showing the uh, positive signs, Europe still with problems but uh, problems that uh, are solved, maybe not in a, in a on the way or perfection that uh, some of you may desire, but Things are moving, China is moving, it has a, a new administration which is the, has expressed the importance of deregulating, opening up and moving the country forward. So the, on the macroeconomic front, we are better off than we were a few months ago and indeed in 2009, 2010. I will also tell you that uh, the, the sheer fact that there will be a new management team at the Secretariat, a new Director General, and very importantly, four new Deputy Director Generals, which uh, can uh, lead a new relation with the ambassadors. Uh, my, my friend Pascal Lamy has been, and is always, a very effective uh, workaholic. He works a lot. He has moved the organization forward has done quite a bit. But the simple fact that you have the same team eight years in front of an organization uh, and there's a new team coming in, uh, that's psychologically an interesting element. A as you very well know, negotiations are uh, at the beginning, in the middle, and in the end, a very human experience where psychology plays a, a big, big role. So. That's, that's an, another interesting element. But I would say a, a third element, which is a risk, big challenge, but I would say also a great opportunity, is the fact that there are a bunch of different free trade agreements, NAFTA being one of the leading agreements in many ways, in many ways uh, for the importance, for the fact that it was the first one and maybe was the one that started creating all the dynamics of agreements in this continent and in other continents. But uh, there are a bunch of others. Uh, there are two big ones that are being discussed as we speak, the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, an agreement that is, is really large uh, with the inclusion of Japan, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, uh, the countries on the Pacific of, of uh, South America, and very important countries in, in Asia. 
that's, that's very important. But I will say that uh, by far my personal perception is that the agreement announced between the EU and the US is, can be a very important catalyst for um, the Doha round in the way in which NAFTA was a catalyst for the Uruguay round. If you recall, the Uruguay round started in 1986, those negotiations, and they were also stalling. And finally, when, when NAFTA was announced and we were close to the end, suddenly energy in Geneva started happening and flexibilities were brought to the table in Geneva. I think in, in, uh, that the agreement between the U.S. and the EU will uh, and has the capacity of doing the same in Geneva. It's, it's an agreement that uh, you very well know is uh, an agreement between two units that represent 50% of the world economic product. is an agreement that represents 30% of trade in the world. And very importantly, this agreement will be more than an agreement that would eliminate barriers uh, such as taxes and tariffs and quotas. It's an agreement that will establish new rules to make trade, uh, new rules uh, with respect to standards and regulations. Uh, as you very well know, the standards and regulations are an impediment that increases the cost tremendously, the cost of export. The harmonization in some way between the standards and regulations between the US and the EU will create such a fabulous market in, in uh, the North Atlantic that would be a great challenge. Why a great challenge for the WTO? The rules of WTO were drafted in 1994. So these rules are almost 20 years old. In 20 years, the way of doing business, the way of integrating value chains, the importance of uh, internet, the importance of everything that has happened with electronic changes, the importance of services, uh, has uh, been uh, a, a big change on, on business. And that change has not been reflected in the rules of trade of uh, WTO, uh, trade agreements, these ones that I have mentioned. And um, you know, how, do you, how do you go about doing that? Uh, I think that the announcement of uh, the transatlantic uh, partnership between the US and the EU, uh, although it's a challenge in many ways, is also an opportunity. An opportunity because I'm convinced that the US and the EU are responsible global players. They were indeed the founding fathers of GATT and WTO. I believe that there is for no, no country interest, not for the US and not for the EU, to have a, an organization that congregates most of the developing countries and very importantly, the least developed countries that becomes irrelevant and uh, plays a second role in, in the world. So I'm convinced that although the US and the EU have launched this tremendous, uh, tremendously important negotiation in the North Atlantic, they also keep their commitment to move in Geneva. I do believe also that countries in Geneva are listening to this announcement with uh, uh, a lot of care and that uh, this is, is a call for action in Geneva. It's a call for flexibilities from everybody, and I do believe that flexibilities has to have to come uh, according to size, that countries that are larger, uh, countries that are larger not only developed, but developing countries have the responsibility of uh, being more flexible and delivering the uh, access that least developed and small economies have been expecting for the last 12 years. That said, uh, what does uh, Erminio Blanco bring, could bring to the organization? Uh, I'm, I'm in general a very modest person, but uh, I have been told that in a campaign you cannot be modest. So <laughs> allow me not to be modest for a while. <laughs> so first of all, uh, I think the fact, as you said, Susan, the fact that I'm Mexican 
uh, speaks uh, very well about me. It speaks very well about the Mexican candidate. And indeed, it has been very well perceived by the countries that we have visited and the representatives of different countries to with whom we have interacted. Mexico is a country that through trade and other reforms, but very importantly through trade, has moved uh, very importantly forward. You know, the sheer fact that Mexico exports every day more than one billion dollars per day shows you that we are being very successful uh, and, and that we have de developed the capacity to generate jobs, to generate middle class prosperity. And indeed, for those of you that have visited Mexico, we have in Mexico regions that are not very different from the regions of a developed country. Not very far from there, we have regions that are not very different from regions of very poor countries. So in Mexico, we have those two realities, realities of developed country and developing country. And that gives, gives Mexico a, a role as a bridge between those two realities. Mexico uh, is, is a country that not only has uh, shown that trade has been an important uh, leverage for growth, but if you see what has been happening in Mexico under the leadership of President Peña Nieto these few months, that changes to lead Mexico to a further level of competitiveness uh, and looking forward and looking open at the world uh, will bring Mexico to a new stage. The, the things that have happened in Mexico in the last a little bit more than three months were things that Mexico were being discussed for the last 40 years. Labor reform, education reform, telecommunications reform, and I'm sure that in not many months uh, ahead we will have also a uh, energy reform and a, and a fiscal reform. So all of that as a Mexican that wants to lead an organization like the WTO is a Mexican that has the DNA of trade being a leading leverage for growth. Herminio Blanco as a, as a person is somebody that has a, a very extensive negotiation with uh, the large countries, with the U.S. Uh, with the U.S. we negotiated NAFTA, as you know. It, that's a his truly historical agreement. Truly historical because it's the first time that the U.S. negotiated with a developing country. Obviously historical for Mexico, but also it's, a, it's an, an agreement that, that was very complex, very complicated also on the political and on the technical side. So that experience, the experience of having led the negotiations uh, between Mexico and the EU, my experience of having helped launch the negotiation uh, between Mexico and Japan, my experience negotiating with countries in Central America, with Bolivia and other countries, gives me uh, the uh, practical experience, uh, the political and technical experience of negotiating with large countries and small countries. And that's what you need in the WTO. You, you need to know how both entities, what type of, both type of countries uh, react, what it takes to move them politically to reach this agreement amongst 159 countries. I will tell you, and I will end this uh, by, by this last comment, that my experience in the last more than a decade in the private sector has been also very, very useful. I'm a member of uh, different boards, um, management boards and also uh, advisory boards of companies in, in the US, uh, in Mexico, in Central America, in, in Europe, and in, in Asia. Uh, that experience plus the fact that I have a company that is called IQOM, I thought it was going to be so obvious, IQ for intelligence and COM for commercial, so commercial intelligence, but it's not, we're gonna change the name of the company. <laughs> <laughs> on the, your suggestion. <laughs> uh, uh, that experience in the private sector does give me a different perspective. Sometimes things that are being discussed by uh, public representatives 
and things that maybe uh, representatives are willing to, to kill each other, kill quote unquote each other in, in Geneva, maybe for, from the point of view of business, they are not as relevant. And having this business perspective gives you also an idea of where you have to spend your political uh, strengths and where you have to put your political energy and leave the other least re less relevant uh, elements out uh, from the negotiation. I believe that this combination of uh, uh, having an extensive practice in negotiations, an extensive practice on politics, and an extensive practice in the private sector gives me the, the skills and, and the experience to lead this uh, organization, the Great World Trade Organization, into a new stage where it keeps on being relevant and competitive in the world trade. So I, I will cut there my comments and, and expect your comments, questions, and other type of uh, uh, interventions. Please. So I want to thank you for those wonderful comments and your insights as to where you believe the WTO should go. Um, you solved my problem because someone handed me a note saying we didn't have time for questions, but you want questions. So you solved my problem and we'll have some <laughs> questions. Um, if you would raise your hand and identify yourself, that would be great. Yes. This is Guy Erb from the Berkeley Research Group. It's a pleasure to see you. I mean, yeah. I wish I could share entirely your optimism, and I want to be optimistic about what you described in your remarks to the OTM Council that you wanted to integrate these uh, free trade areas into the World Trade Organization. But I've sometimes thought, given what it's taken to get practically nowhere in Doha, that we need a longer period, uh, not a pleasant one, in which the old GATT-based trade system will really break down will find a number of free trade areas, and in, when the situation gets intolerable, they will eventually begin to negotiate. Uh, what do you think of that more pessimistic view? Well, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, the, the mission and the responsibility of the new director general of WTO to let things go to the intolerable uh, stage. <laughs> I think there are other solutions. Uh, I, I do believe that if you look at the WTO in 10 years uh, and uh, the relations between the WTO and these free trade agreements, especially these new massive free trade agreements, and the on only relation is through Article 24 of GATT and Article 5 of GATT, then something will be terribly missing. But there are, there are many other ways in which you can integrate the energy of these agreements, the new rules of these agreements, the, the new ways in which they have been incorporating the new practices in business and the new ways in which governments are being uh, designing new protectionist rules. I think you can integrate all of that work into WTO. Uh, and that is a must. And it's a must because the WTO, to remain uh, having the honor of having the W as World Trade Organization, it has to be the leading organization. And what do you, I mean by leading? Leading in the sense that it reflects the reality of how trade is done in the world and the reality of what are the different uh, obstacles to, uh, tr to the flows of trade, very especially the actions, the more sophisticated actions that governments are taking. So I am a, a, uh, not a pessimist. I'm a, a, a on the optimist side. I think that that can be done. I think that that requires convincing the uh, ambassadors, convincing government, but very, very importantly, the private sector, the business communities and, in general, civil society has to play a central role in demanding that their government show more flexibility. Maybe some of the players, such as the U.S., showing uh, decreasing their level of ambition, and maybe some of the larger 
developing countries, increasing their level of ambition, and finding a way in which we can go beyond Doha, design these new routes. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Rob House, uh, uh, New York University Law School. Um, so, um, a couple of questions, uh, very brief, that follow up on the, uh, one of them follows up on the previous question. So, let's say your optimism um, is, it doesn't turn out to be the, the right judgment. And there could be economic and political events that mean that there is actually an impasse uh, within the next year or so in Doha. Then what's the, the plan B? What's the, you know, what steps would you take at that point uh, to address the fact that an impasse has been arrived at? Well, uh, you know, this, uh, in a sense, there's no alternative. You know, th there's this hypothesis that if you get an impasse and, and you cannot solve this, then you take uh, the Doha agenda, you throw it off the table, and then you bring a new agenda. I don't think that's a possibility. I don't think that's on the realm of the possible. Simply because if you do that, the table for negotiations will be pretty empty. I think many countries, especially the least developed countries, and many developing countries will simply not sit at the table unless you get a substantive solution for the Doha round. Uh, having said that, I agree that it, that is not easy that 12 years of efforts uh, uh, have been done and nothing has happened at the, this point in time. However, if, if you really look at the anatomy of, of uh, complex negotiations such as Doha, you see many fronts and in every front nothing is happening. Well, but also in, in, with the experience on these complex negotiations, you understand also that if there's a roadblock in one important group, the instructions given by governments is if nothing moves in this group, stop everything else. Just put a roadblock in everything else. And on the contrary sense, if we can find ways to move on the negotiation of tariffs on industrial products, and uh, you know maybe something to begin with on, on agriculture, if you start moving on those, I think the rest is, is, is not simple, but it can move. So I, I don't think it's, there's, there's a, there's a uh, it, it is an alternative for, for Doha not to function. The question is how, and that will take consultations in Geneva, it will take consultations in some capitals, and a lot of convincing with the business community. I think the business community can get quite a bit of benefits, quite a bit of openings, in, in, uh, in Geneva with the Doha. Uh, granted, big openings in the Pacific, big openings on, uh, on the uh, Atlantic, but in, in Doha you have this massive amount of countries, smaller size, but greater dynamics and uh, markets that can be very attractive in, in the future. Perhaps the complication is the size of the audience. Um, and I don't want to be optimistic or pessimistic, but maybe pragmatic. And given the events of what we're seeing today, which is the increasing interest in regional um, negotiations, um, is there not the third scenario of somehow WTO being part or helpful or at least creative as these regional um, negotiations proceed and then to those countries or groups that are part of this very large organization being almost left out of the process becoming aware that by being left out they are being hurt so dramatically that only then is there this ability to put it all together so you almost have to have other successes outside of the global pack to be able to get to a point where uh, there can be a global pact. What is your hmm. feeling about that well, scenario? You, you are reflecting, uh, I think, very clearly what happened with NAFTA. You know, what, with NAFTA, countries in Geneva suddenly felt left out. I think at this point in time, 
having all the energy and the importance of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and having the TTIP in the North Atlantic, the message is very clear in Geneva. Either you move or you will be left behind. And uh, what I, I just said is that that message for Geneva, I think it will also be answered by the US and the EU because is, uh, I'm sure, and by my conversations with representatives of both uh, um, great uh, unions, uh, their position is we want Doha to succeed. So I do believe that pragmatically, as you said, you can lead this group to uh, having a substantial result for Doha. And if you do that, immediately you have to incorporate, you, you are at the possibility of incorporating new rules that reflect the way of doing business. And that's good for everybody. Can you or should you be part of any of this process of the regional negotiations, or is that outside of your purview? It is, it is uh, there's a, a already a quite, quite an intensive, uh, uh, that could be improved, uh, and a scheme of monitoring these agreements. I think that the learning that WTO can do on a first stage, on reviewing why is it that the T, uh, T, T, P, T, 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 P, uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, trans Partnership okay, is doing this rule. What is the meaning of that rule? What would imply for the countries in uh, the WTO which are not a part of it if they don't move into that or if they move into that? What would be the benefits? I think that that discussion has to start uh, very soon and that through that discussion, the movement in, in Geneva to, to move at, towards uh, these this new uh, rules of trade, uh, modern rules of trade, has to happen. Precisely because what you said, nobody wants to be left out. I think is, it is in the interest of these governments to be attractive, uh, attractive destinations for investment that generates jobs and prosperity. And the way to do that is to have a first class set of rules for trade and investment. Okay, so just two questions together, one in the back, right here, so you can see me, and then right here. Good evening, my name is Laura Tiring. I represent a company, Japanese company, Fuji Vegetable Oil. I have several questions that interest my field, my, my job. <laughs> I hope I can translate them into one. First off, my most important question is with regards to the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Partnership Alliance. My company exports palm oil from Malaysia into everywhere in the world. We have plants all over the world. How soon do you see, foresee this agreement to finally come to an end? <laughs> and if there's an, and once it's official, how soon does it, is it published and what source can we find it? Uh, you, you mean the TPP? TPP well, or yeah. any other well, you know, this, this agreement, trade agreement. This agreement is, is, is uh, uh, countries are spending quite a bit of effort in moving forward. Uh, Japan becoming uh, a member, uh, hopefully not uh, uh, very far into the future, in the middle of, of this year, or, or somewhere in, in the fall. Uh, it is a complex negotiation. Uh, there, are, there are many things that are pending yet, but there's great interest and great energy from the different countries. I, I know on the, on, on the front of Mexico, I know on the front of Canada, uh, the, the US, uh, Chile, Peru, um, I, I think uh, Colombia, all, all, all of them are quite interested. To give you a forecast would be highly irresponsible on my part. <laughs> <laughs> I just said I tried. Um, Maria, my name is Mariana Sanchez de Obando, and I have a question just as a regular citizen of the world. <laughs> okay. 
Um, and that is, I would like to hear your thoughts or what your vision is in terms of, you mentioned earlier that the rules of the WTO were written 20 years ago. And in those 20 years, the way we conduct business has changed. And I think it has changed in many ways. One of them is in terms of the awareness that businesses have of social and environmental responsibility. The other one is the greater demand from consumers in terms of fair trade, not just free trade. And another one is a greater awareness as humans towards the responsibility that we have towards one another. So I would like to understand what are your thoughts or your vision for the role that the WTO should play or the influence that the WTO should have in terms of how those things, you also mentioned value chain has yeah. changed. I think now it's also about values chain. So I would like to hear your thoughts on how the WTO should influence that aspect. Well, it, it is every one of the uh, topics that you mentioned have uh, a high importance for, for humanity, no, no doubt. And uh, trade does have an impact. And those values have an impact on trade. Uh, I think that the way in which the WTO, and obviously this is a decision at the end of the members, the Director General can facilitate, can talk, can uh, try to persuade, can try to move things around. But it's obvious that uh, the decision makers are the governments, number one. N number two, my, my sense is that one has to uh, look into every one of those high interests and see how you take care of those interests without imposing unduly high uh, obstacles to trade. Uh, the, that reason being because uh, my experience, the experience of my country, the experience of many countries, is that trade is precisely for developing countries a source of growth and prosperity. So you do have this balancing act of growth and prosperity, so, and, and that implies not to impose unduly high obstacles to trade and uh, the uh, high responsibility that every one of us have and, and, and governments have to defend and to take care of those high objectives that you have, that you mentioned, sorry. I think our time has, I think our time has come to an end because it's five after seven. I want to thank you, well, Dr. Thank Blanco, you for coming, for being so open and frank and asking everyone, answering everyone's questions and being, uh, so decisive in terms of what your view is for the vision of the WTO should you become uh, the new general director. So with that, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much.